Evan has been with us before. I hope he will come again because I have another idea for the next season. And it's okay. I only have about 80 talks. So. Well, you know, I'm trying to keep it broken up season. Okay. So we're about the right time to be thinking about it. So I'm going to hand it over to Evan. And, um, and your vets are doing well. My vets are in. That's all that matters. <laughs> Okay. okay, thank you. My name is Evan Weiner. I've been doing this type of thing since 1971. In fact, one of my high school classmates at Spring Valley High School, uh, his uh, sister married Gil Hodges Jr. Uh, back in 1972, and they're still married after 50 years, uh, I read. Anyway, uh, my background is radio and TV and magazines and newspapers. I spent a good time in the 1980s covering baseball, uh, George Steinbrenner, and also uh, some Mets, except I missed the 1986 World Series because I was too busy covering the USFL, NFL antitrust trial, which actually for me ended up being a lot better since I got to see Donald Trump every day and I got to see Roy Cohn. I got to see all these other characters who were part of the USFL, NFL. Trial. But uh, speaking of characters, there's an American icon, uh, Lawrence Peter Barrer. And uh, I spoke at his museum quite a bit between 2006 and 2011, and he'd come up with me. And we wouldn't necessarily be talking about baseball uh, when I was talking there. We'd be talking about other topics, and he'd always come up. And he saw most of my talks. I spoke there twice a year. He was always there. Good job, kid. Let's go in the back. Let's eat. Got some good tuna fish for you today. So anyway, Yogi Berra was on TV in October, virtually every October during the 1950s, except for what years? 54 and 1959. In fact, Yogi was on TV in 1960 and 61, 62, and 63 and 64, all with the Fall Classic. Uh, and he was also the first guy to really have an agent going out there and marketing him, which is another story for another day, a guy by the name of Frank Scott. American Icon, 1950s. Jacques Barzard, 1950s, is writing uh, a series of essays. He's a French philosopher, and uh, he's talking about baseball and baseball in the American culture. And he says, in 1954, in one of these essays, Whoever want, uh, wants to know the heart and mind of America had better learn baseball. And he suggested you do it basically at the Sandlot level or do it at the minor league level. Uh, and Barzan was firmly convinced that baseball was the national pastime. And probably he was correct because uh, back in PS 151, I had to read about Casey at the back. And that's a slide from a Disney cartoon back in the day. Uh, Jerry Colonna was uh, one of the voices of Casey at the back. Ernest Thayer, baseball hero or not? I'm asking you, is he a baseball hero or not? He wrote Casey at the bat. Now, there's one thing that I have in common with Thayer. Thayer wrote for the San Francisco Examiner roughly 1887, 1888. And I wrote for them in 2001. So we have that in common, even though centuries apart. Uh, is he a baseball hero? Well, he was a columnist with the San Francisco Examiner between 1886 and 1888. And Casey was printed June 3rd, 1888, without author's credit. Just threw it up there. Signed Finn. The only people who knew who Finn was were the people from Harvard, where he went to school. And he read the poem at the class reunion in 1995. The poem was a throwaway. He got five dollars for it. I got a hundred bucks per shot in 2001, and I figure with with inflation, we probably got the same money. Five bucks back in 1888. But uh, the poem goes nowhere, or it's supposed to go nowhere. It's a throwaway. Just decided I'm going to do this, and, and I do the same thing. I do commentaries every day on the podcast, and there are certain days that you, you know, you got to just fill in time, and that apparently was a filler. But this guy, DeWolf Hopper, and some of you might know his daughter, Heather Hopper. She was an actress, gossip column, basically. Uh, anyway, 
this guy is an actor, and it's 1888, and he gets a hold of the wolf, uh, he gets a hold of the poem, Casey at the Bat, which was syndicated, and uh, he likes it. And uh, he finds out that members of the New York Giants and the Chicago White Stockings are coming out to see him, so he performs the play for them and gets applause. And that would be the first of more than 10,000 times that he performed Casey at the Bat. Oh, this is the Springfield, New Jersey Library. You don't mind if I talk about the competition, do you? No. Okay, it's far away anyway. Anyway, this is a Regina Sublime. This is a big cylinder. This thing works. Um, somebody in Springfield was a hermit. He lived alone and he collected a lot of stuff. And uh, the stuff that he collected that was valuable sits in the Springfield, New Jersey library, including this. And there, behind me there are ice skates and a few other things. And uh, the librarian, or the head of the library over there, uh, said, uh, let me show you. I can play that. And she had uh, John Philip Sousa march on there. But if you had one of those in the 1890s, you would be able to hear Casey at the bat because of this guy, Russell Hunting. So here's the question. Was it baseball that was popular or was it the culture that made baseball popular? It's a question that you can't answer. But baseball becomes thoroughly entwined in the American culture. It doesn't take long. It's right after the Civil War. Anyway, Russell Hunting was an entertainer and he was a sound recordist. And he records it twice, 1893, 1898. And because it's Casey and uh, he's supposed to be Irish, he uses a uh, heavy Irish pro because it might be King Con Kelly who is Casey at the back. 1905, John Kaiser is at uh, Menlo Park in New Jersey. He records it for Edison. And Hopper would record it for Victor before it was his master's voice, RK, oh, RCA Victor. That would come out in 1906. Now, if you want to listen to it, you can listen to it on one of these things. This is up in Chikunga, uh, Quebec. This is some guy's garage. Uh, I speak on cruise ships. And I looked at that. I said, I've got to get that picture because that's what you might listen to, to Hopper, uh, Casey at the Bat, in the 19-teens. Uh, Hopper would commit to film, silent film, a uh, short made by uh, Lee DeForest, 1922. There's a 1927 version of the movie with Wallace Beery and Jerry Colonna uh, recorded the rendition that Disney used as the basis of a 1946 cartoon. Jackie Gleason performed it on his TV show. Johnny Bench, Tug McGraw, George Steinbrenner, Billy Martin together in Tampa all did the poem, often in orchestral settings. So that's PS 151, Woodside Quays. I went there between 1964 and 1967. And I had a fourth grade teacher. Her name was Miss Alexander. And uh, we thought she was about 145 years old. She was injured in her 60s. She had the white blouse. She had the blue skirt. And she had a neck or a tissue always over here. Fastest person I ever saw go. Right? Blow her nose. Anyway, she gives us an assignment. I'm in fourth grade, uh, and this is 1965. And uh, I was, by the way, thrown out of kindergarten and sent to first grade. So I'm a year behind that, or a year ahead of everybody else. She says, analyze Casey at the bat. OK. I'm living in Queens. The Mets are playing in Queens, and they're winning 60 games a year, right? They're terrible, right? So I figured Casey would fit in with, with you know, the Mets, you know? I, I say, no. He's a lousy player. He struck out with the bases loaded. There's no joy in Munville. The mighty Casey struck out. Well, Miss Alexander, uh, Miss Alexander, complete with the blue hair. Remember, she had blue hair? No aluminum reostats, just the blue hair. She says, uh, you've got it all wrong. What do you mean I got it all wrong? He's a lousy player. He struck out with the bases loaded. How can he be a good player? Oh, no, no, no. It's about man's failure. Comes up, has a chance to do something, and he fails. Well, what's the poem about? Anybody know what the poem is really about? It's about nothing. It's like Seinfeld. It's like, it's about nothing. Uh, a guy strikes out. 
It's not about man's failures. In 1935, they are told the uh, Syracuse Post Standard, the poem has no basis in fact. There's no King Kong Kelly or anybody else. There's no Mudville. There's no joy in Mudville. Uh, sort of like big, uh, baseball's beginnings in Cooperstown. Uh, there's no basis in fact, except for this guy that they found uh, who was a drunk in Denver in the early 20th century. Uh, his name also was Abner. Um, that, uh, oh yeah, I saw Abner Doubleday lay out the field. The guy was six years old, right? So, no basis in fact. Hey, when you see that sign, take me out to the ball game. And the polo grounds, what do you think? What do you think? Well, yeah, there was, there's this guy by the name of Jack Norwood, songwriter, singer, performer in vaudeville, and he's sitting on the subway, and he's studying that sign, ball game today at the polo grounds. And he's studying it and studying it and studying it. Now, he never got to a baseball game, so he really didn't know what baseball was all about. But he's studying the sign, and he uh, meets uh, his uh, co-writer, Von Tilzer, he says, I, gotta, I, I think I want to write a baseball song. A song made popular by him, actually, in the 1970s at Comiskey Park in Chicago. Then Harry Carey goes to the Cubs. They're on WGN. Oh, what you don't see here with Harry, because I worked on a show with Harry in 1994, you don't see his sixth best friend's name, Bud. <laughs> Most of you got it. The ones who didn't get it, Harry liked to drink a little bit during the game. But what? The sponsor. Although Gussie Bush tried to kill him because uh, when he was the St. Louis Cardinals announcer, uh, Gussie Bush, the owner of the uh, Cardinals, knew his wife was having an affair and swore he was going to kill the guy that was having the affair if he ever found him. <laughs> Harry survived. <laughs> Harry survived. Went out to Oakland with Charlie Finley, and they came back to Chicago with the White Sox and the Cubs. And there's a tradition at Wrigley Field, even though Harry's gone a long time, uh, that uh, there's the seventh inning stretch. Oh, by the way, the seventh inning stretch started by William Howard Taft, the President of the United States, back in 1910. There were some uh, suffragists in the Oval Office saying, one vote, one vote, one vote, one vote. And Taft gets really upset and uh, tells one of his aides, see if, uh, see if we can get uh, tickets to the Washington Nationals game. I want to slink out of here, although he was over 300 pounds, hard to slink. And he ended up there. And then in between the seventh, top of the seventh, bottom of the seventh inning, guy's a big man sitting in the 19-inch seat. He gets up and stretches. Everybody else gets up and stretches. And that's the beginning, allegedly, of the seventh inning stretch. Anyway, here's Harry. Oh, so by the way, at Wrigley Field, the tradition is you sing the song, or a celebrity sings the song, in between the top of the seventh, bottom of the seventh, but you got to do it under condition. You do it poorly. <laughs> because Harry did it poorly. Take Me Out to the Ball Game was written in 1908, written by Jack Norworth and Albert Von Tilzer. They never saw a baseball game. They never saw a baseball game. They made it all up. The song would become famous on the vaudeville stage that year. Uh, and here are the lyrics. Katie Casey was baseball mad, had the fever and had it bad, just to root for the hometown crew every sue, which was slang for French money, every sue Katie blew. On Saturday, her young beau called to see if she liked to go to see a show. But Miss Kate said, no, I'll tell you what you can do. Take me out to the ball game. Do you know it was written from a woman's viewpoint? It was written from a woman's viewpoint. Uh, the song uh, was an ode to his, actually at that point, ex-girlfriend, uh, a progressive and outspoken Trixie Forganza. And she was a famous vaudeville actress at the time and also a suffragette. Now, there she is. She's wearing a sash asking to vote, basically. And uh, there is Trixie. She was Katie Casey. Now, we don't really know who Katie Casey was. Now, I don't know. She might have been a Brooklyn, whatever they call them, Brooklyn team, bridegrooms in those days. She might have been a New York Giants fan because they were Giants. She might have been made up. 
She might have been 18. She might have been 21. She might have been working. She might be a student somewhere. We really don't know much about Katie, although Trixie is uh, Trixie's Katie. Casey, Katie, Katie Casey knew baseball. She was not happy with umpires in the third stanza. She was standing in the front row. Uh, if you hear that part of the uh, of the song, uh, that song, uh, she was strong. You know, she had strong convictions against the umpires, and she knew every player. They didn't have numbers. They didn't have their names on their back in those days. But she knew all the players. And she knew how to get them going by singing a rousing tune. Take me out to the ball game. Now, Katie might have been part of the new women movement of the early 20th century. She took the lead. She was engaged, living in the world uninhibited and filled with passion. That was a young woman, some young women, back in 1908. Nora Bays made the song famous on the vaudeville stage with another song called Shine Up Harvest Moon. Now, of the two songs, which do you think gets played more in 2022? Take Me Out to the Ball Game or Shine on Harvest Moon? Uh, she, Norma, Norma, uh, Bays, Nora Bays was uh, Norwood's wife at the time, one of about three or four wives, and uh, they co-wrote Shine on Harvest Moon together. Uh, but baseball never, really never, ever, ever embraced the song until 1934 at a high school game in Los Angeles. And finally, the fourth game of the 1934 World Series between Detroit and St. Louis, it was finally played at a ballpark. Take me out to the ballpark. The song, well, it gets into movies. Frank Sinatra, Esther Williams, uh, Gene Kelly. Take me out to the ball game. And what was that famous uh, line in the uh, O'Brien to uh, O'Brien to somebody to Goldberg? I forgot who the, the uh, second baseman was, but uh, that was part of it. And uh, take me out to the ball game. Uh, it's there. Night at the Opera. It's there. Uh, you might remember the scene after Groucho comes back with the stowaways, uh, Chico, Harpo, and the guy who took Zeppo's place, Alan Jones who's this uh, great tenor, and uh, Groucho's the head of the opera company working for Margaret Dumont. And uh, they got to knock out the uh, tenor, uh, who is supposed to be the star, so they can have this other guy as the star. And they have to kill some time. And one of the things that was done is Harpo and Chico hands out sheet music to the guys in the uh, orchestra that take me out to the ball game. And, he comes down and, of course, is selling peanuts and Cracker Jacks. Uh, the song, Harpo Marx returns it uh, to it. I Love Lucy in 1955 included in numerous uh, movies and TV shows. Take Me Out to the Ball Game was honored as the 2008 Songwriters Hall of Fame towering song 100 years later. And it's 114 years later. And like I said, it is probably the only song from 1908 that is constantly played on a daily basis from February through November in the United States, in Canada, in some Pacific Rim countries like Japan and Korea, and in Latin America at games, and you know what, probably at Winter League games as well in Australia and in the Caribbean. The tune ranked in surveys as one of the top 10 songs in the 20th century and is third only to Happy Birthday and the Star Spangled Banner as one of the easily recognized songs in America. Oh, Norworth first saw her game in 1928, 20 years afterwards. Von Tilser was finally at a game, 1940, 32 years later. Okay, who's on first? Who's on first? What's on second? Third base. Uh, Adam Costello. Emma and Costello were doing vaudeville burlesque routines. In fact, they met on the burlesque, burlesque circuit. There were two burlesque circuits. One with a K meant the girls took their clothes off. QUE, it was pretty much a family show. And that's where they met. Uh, it's one of America's classic comedy routines. In fact, it may be the ultimate comedy routine done by a two-man or Nichols and May or my cousin who comes up later in this talk. Jerry Stiller, uh, Stiller and Mirror. 
Uh, so it could be a man and a woman. I don't think there have ever been two women teams. I can't think of it off the top of my head. You had two women. You had Gracie Allen and George Burns. You, know, you had Mary Benny with Jack Benny and all that. Uh, who's on first was a type of vaudeville act. That was common. It was common style. It descended from uh, turn of the century burlesque sketches that used play on words and names, also possibly called rounders, which is kind of interesting because baseball evolved from what game? Rounders. Rounders. Uh, Abbott, uh, <coughs> but Abbott said that it was taken from an older routine called Who's the Boss? A 1993 obituary of comedy sketch writer Michael J. Musto states that shortly after Abbott and Costello teamed up on the vaudeville circuit in the 1930s, uh, they paid Musto $15 to write the script. Now, I've spoken on cruise ships. I have a number of acquaintances who are uh, comedians, like John Joseph, who did a variation, except a rock and roll variation of this. He said, of course they paid Musto the money. But my best buddy is Max Docelli, who grew up with Seinfeld and Larry David and Carol Leifler and Paul Reiser and Gilbert Gottfried and Caroline Days and um, and had, then went off to cruise ships and was like the king of comedy on cruise ships. He said, come on, we're comics, we steal everything. They didn't pay Musto any money. And thanks, Max, uh, I'll be speaking to you. Uh, anyway, the uh, origin. Uh, Abbott's wife uh, recalled him performing the routine with another comedian before Costello. Uh, after they formed in burlesque in 1936, he and Costello continued to hone the routine. It was a big hit. In the fall of 1937, they're on tour with a, a review called Hollywood Bandwagon. And then there's this, the Kate Smith Show, right in the middle of spring training. Kate Smith was one of the top radio performers in 1938, along with uh, uh, Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, and Jack Benny. She was up there, like number one, two, or three. Anyway, one of the producers, Abbott Costello, our book, one of the producers of the Kate Smith Hour said, I don't like this routine. I really don't like this routine. Uh, after they, they watched uh, Abbott Costello perform at the theater. Uh, but uh, they, had, they claimed they had no other material. Uh, nothing. We have nothing. So you're either stuck with this or not. And the show is coming up to showtime. And they said, oh, all right, but it's a terrible routine. It's an awful routine. I've worked in radio TV. I know producers. I know executives. They're not the brightest bulbs in the world. <laughs> because to do it was such a big ratings draw, the pro producer said, uh, yeah, try out your sketch. You know, if you have nothing else, just try it out. OK, in reality, Evan Costello planned this bluff. And they saw this as a chance to introduce who's on first to a wider audience. And they said, we have nothing else. OK, do it. The rest is history. It's a hit. It's a hit. Uh, it premieres on March 24th, 1938. And they may have gotten some help from John Grant, who was Costello's writer, and a guy named Will Glickman. Any Car 54, Where Are You fans in here? Mm -hmm. Will Glickman wrote some of the uh, Car 54, Where Are You's. He got $500 a show, which is not all that much money back at the, in uh, 1960. Oh, the routine had legs. Uh, performed at the White House, performed in movies, uh, also on radio and TV. And Abbott and Costello were quote-unquote enshrined in Baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown in 1956. Oh, Vin Scully is watching a game. Vin Scully, back in the day, used to sign the cast on radio and TV, the first two innings, and then Charlie Steiner would take over uh, on radio. Hey, Charlie, how are you? I haven't spoken to Charlie in a while. Anyway, uh, he, uh, he would take over Charlie, and Vin would do the rest of the game on TV. So one day, Vin Scully is looking at his TV monitor, and he says, now we know the answer to the eternal question of who's on first. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, who's on first? <laughs> well, it's Chin Lung Hu. Uh, in his major league debut was uh, September 1st, 2007 against the San Diego Padres. Now the question is, were there any others from that routine who played major league baseball? Yes or no? 
The answer is yes. A guy by the name of Watt. He played second base, second base with Washington in the mid 1920s. And I just, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's never been a third baseman called I don't give a darn. <laughs> Although some manager might have said that about some third baseman. Oh, I had to go up to Hyde Park, or I went up to Hyde Park about five years ago. And uh, I do a series of talks. I do a talk on the Berlin Olympics because uniquely I work with Marty Glickman. I knew Sam Stoller, the two uh, sprinters who were not allowed on the 4x100 relay uh, to perform. And uh, I also interviewed Gretel Bergman, who was the best athlete in Europe, who was kicked off the uh, German team uh, right before the Olympics. So it's rather unique that I can give you stories about these people who performed 86 years ago now. But I, in my career, I worked with more than the 80s. Anyway, so I went up there and I had some questions to ask Franklin Roosevelt, like, why'd you allow the American team to compete in Berlin and legitimize Hitler? The answer is that he didn't think athletes should sit out. And Marty Glickman <coughs> agreed with that. Because Marty said, I'm going to uh, Berlin. I'm going to win that medal. I'm going to shove it right in the Fuhrer's face. Uh, Sam, Sam, no, Sam was quiet all the time. And, uh, so anyway, that was that. Marty agreed with that decision. Uh, he was also the first guy on TV in the United States, um, which was an experimental TV on Channel One, uh, opening the World's Fair in 1939. So I wanted to know, hey, what was it like being a TV star in 1939? And the other was, why did you allow baseball to continue after Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, 1941? He gets a letter from this guy, uh, Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who actually helped baseball get its antitrust exemption as a judge back in the uh, 19-teens. Anyway, and he was brought in to clean up baseball after the uh, 1919 White Sox betting scam. Uh, so he gets a letter. Landis says, what are we supposed to do? We cut the 1918 season, not because of the Spanish flu, but because of World War I. Uh, we cut it by a month and had the World Series. Should we or should we not play? Roosevelt said, I honestly feel that it would be best for the country to keep baseball going in the green light letter. Baseball provides a recreation which does not last uh, over two or two and a half hours. He's been dead for 77 years. Uh, and it can be got for very little cost, or well, maybe to his class, very little cost. Or maybe if you go to StubHub, like at 6.30 and across the street from the stadium. And incidentally, I hope that night games can be extended because it gives an opportunity to the day shift to see a game occasionally. In those days, in the western part of the time zone, which would be Detroit, maybe Cleveland, uh, and today, sun doesn't go down until 9 o'clock. So, or 9.30, so the night game, theoretically, wasn't a night game. But uh, Roosevelt said, go ahead, which the NFL also took as a letter for them that they could go ahead and play uh, games in National Hockey League as well. Uh, movies. How many of you seen baseball-themed movies? Like Safe at Home, which I saw as a kid, with Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle and William Frawley, which was a horrible movie. How many baseball movies do you have here? Moneyball, probably? Probably have Moneyball. Uh, and, and a few others. Well, this guy was in the movies, 10 movies in his career. Of course, he's the big. And uh, his first movie was in 1920, and he was already a stereotyped actor. Heading home. Starts famous. What else? A baseball star. He starred in Babe Comes Home, 1927 silent movie. No prince survives because the way the prints were made, they eventually would corrode and erode. Uh, this one was actually staged, Speedy, in 1928. Uh, there's a clip that you can see where um, he's signing autographs and he has to go to Yankee Stadium and Harold Lloyd's a cab driver and it's a cab ride that Babe will never forget. Uh, overall, he was in 10 movies. But uh, the first real baseball idol in the films was this guy by the name of Mike Dolan, Donald. Now, here's another library uh, tidbit for you. The original studios, the original movie studios were in Fort Lee. 
And if you go to the parking lot of the Fort Lee Library, you are standing on a lot that was used in the 19 teens. And the parking spaces were kind of interesting because you would be able to park and see what movie was made in uh, the uh, parking lot over in, uh, at the Fort Lee Library. So it's, it may be rather interesting just to park there and walk around before you go to the library. Anyway, anybody here? Mike Donlin. He's a good baseball player. He hit 333 lifetime. But there was no money in baseball. There was some money on stage in vaudeville, so he would take breaks away from baseball. He quits in 1914 and gets right into the movies with the uh, stereotype immediately, right off the bat, which also featured his manager, John J. McGraw, who is in the movie. Uh, he made at least 53 appearances on the film. Anybody ever seen the movie Rawhide? It stars Lou Gehrig. Uh, it's a terrible movie. It's just an awful movie, but it has a purpose. It does have a purpose. Here's Lou Gehrig, born in New York City, went to high school in New York City, went to Columbia University, played with the New York Yankees, lived down in New Rochelle on the road that's now called Lou Gehrig Way, and his house is up for sale now. So here's the whole premise of the movie, Raha. He's at Grand Central Terminal announcing his retirement from baseball. He was also married at the time. Uh, he's bought a ranch in Montana with his sister. With his sister. He's married. But in the movie with his sister, and he's going to Montana and he's never going to be seen again because he can't deal with the pressures of being from New York and the first baseman from the New York Yankees. It's an awful movie, but it serves a purpose. Because when he was shooting this movie, he was in the early stages of ALS. And he, by the time he gets to the Mayo Clinic in 1939, the doctors see what he looks like, and they can compare what he looks like, what he looked like in the movie in 1938. They could see how he turned, they could see all of this stuff, uh, and they were able to see how quickly the ALS progressed. Uh, oh, by the way, before I go on, uh, Babe Ruth in, in, uh, in medicine. You know, he was one of the first people ever to get chemotherapy. Know that? One of the first people. Worked a little bit, then it did. But there, the doctors basically told him, there's not much hope. Let's try this, and Babe said, yeah. So Babe may be a baseball hero, 714 home runs and all that. But his most important contribution to humanity may have been chemotherapy. Did you know that? There you go. Anyway, that's uh, Gary Cooper. And by the way, Pride of the Yankees, the movie, Gary Cooper, all of his scenes were done with a mirror. He was right in. Uh, Pride of the Yankees. Oh, cartoons. Baseball box. Disney had its cartoon. Casey at the bat. Warner Brothers had uh, Bugs Bunny. Of course, Bugs Bunny's a heckler. Would you expect anything else other than from Bugs Bunny? You know, he's a heckler. It would have been one hell of a war spell comic. I'm convinced of that. Anyway, so he's a heckler, and the gas house gorillas are playing the teetotalers. They're killing the teetotalers, and Bugs is yelling from his hole in right field, I can moiter you guys with one arm behind my back, and they accept his challenge, and guess what? Bugs won. Uh, League of Their Own, Madonna is there along with Rosie O'Donnell, Jimmy, uh, Gina Davis, Tom Hanks is in that movie. Tom Hanks is playing a character based on Jimmy Fox, who was actually a manager in the Women's League. And uh, Tom Hanks' uh, mortal line in that movie is, there's no crying in baseball. Uh, Bull Durham, actually, I met Max Packin. Uh, remember, anybody recall Max Packin? He was in the movie, Clown Prince of Baseball. He's in the movie briefly because it's about the minor leagues. And he says, I ain't get the girl again. I said, no, because you weren't Nuke and you weren't Crash Davis. And it's about minor league baseball and uh, the meathead pitcher with the 10 cent head, the million dollar arm, and the old veteran catcher who's been in the minor leagues forever, trying to steer him to the major leagues. It becomes a love triangle with Susan Sarandon being the baseball handy, uh, old Durham. Uh, Geisha Boy, Jerry Lewis, uh, you will find that uh, once Major League Baseball hits Los Angeles, 
that Los Angeles Dodger players become a valuable commodity in both movies and TV. And here he is talking to Pee Wee Reese, Jerry Lewis, and uh, anybody who's a fan of Don Zimmer, there's Don Zimmer. So, there's Don Zimmer in that movie, so he should work. Uh, the Natural, you probably have the book, The Natural in the Library, uh, with Robert Redford. Uh, Field of Dreams, Costner again, uh, talking to uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson. Uh, Moneyball, you probably have the book and the movie here. Uh, that is uh, Brad Pitt as uh, Billy Bean, who will tell you he's the smartest guy in baseball. Just ask him. Uh, oh, Bingo Long Traveling All Stars and Mother Kings, starring Billy D. Williams, James Earl Jones, and Richard Pryor. Uh, Bad News Bears, Walter Matthau, Chico Bell Bonds. I don't think I ever saw Walter Matthau in a movie or a role that he was poor in. Hey, he was just a great actor, one of the last Yiddish theater actors, as a matter of fact. Uh, and also, uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Major League, Charlie Sheen, about uh, the Cleveland Indians, before they became the Guardians, finally win. Angels in the outfield, Forbes Field, well, that's not Forbes Field, it's the University of Pittsburgh. It's the wall that uh, is still there in the middle of uh, the University of Pittsburgh. And I figured I'd take a picture there and use it for here. This is five, four years ago when I was out there. And the reason uh, Bing Crosby owned the Pittsburgh Pirates. And that's the reason why Angels in the Outfield was shot there. Uh, Bill Vett sold a small chunk of the Indians, now the Guardians, uh, to Bob Hope in 1946, a native of Cleveland. Hope grew up as a fan of the Indians and jumped at the chance to own a small share of his hometown team. The same year, they were both on the road to baseball, right? Uh, Crosby invested in the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, I knew Nat Fine. Nat Fine was a photographer who had a uh, little photography store in Piermont, New York, by the time I met him when I was 23, 24 years old. Nat Fine was a victim of uh, newspaper consolidation in 1965. Uh, he was with the uh, Journal American, and when uh, Hearst merged the world and, 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 uh, and uh, the Journal and the Herald Tribune, Nat was out the door. That is the only Pulitzer Prize winning sports picture. That's it. None other. And that's Babe Ruth. His last appearance at Yankee Stadium. And Nat was looking for an angle. He was looking for a different angle because if you look closely in 1948, check out these guys. They're the photographers. And they're shooting at Babe who's on the third base line because the Yankee dugout, the Yankee dugout in those days was on the third base line. This is Nat. He came over to home plate. Of course, the story was number three bows out. You, the uniform being retired and all, and they played all Lang Syne. I was trying to make a picture showing number three, but it's only on his back. So I walked behind with the band still playing all Lang Syne, and there was his figure, his thin legs compared to his bulky body, his number three showing. So I made the picture from his back. It is an iconic picture. At uh, City University of New York, the journalism uh, school that they have there, and uh, before COVID, uh, our New York Press Club met there once a month. When you walk out of the building, you see that picture, the Pulitzer Prize winning picture. Oh, Homer Simpson, Hall of Famer or not? Is he in baseball's Hall of Famer or not, Homer Simpson? Yes or no? Homer Simpson, 1992. Springfield, uh, the nuclear power plant team, wins the championship against a whole bunch of uh, major leaguers like Wade Boggs over there, and Roger Clements there at the end. Uh, Mr. Ed, does it look like Sandy Koufax is signing an autograph for Mr. Ed? Oh, Wilbur, can you get me Mr. Koufax's signature? There is uh, Ellen Young, Sandy Koufax, and Mr. Ed. Uh, that's when Mr. Ed tried out for the Dodgers. Uh, like I said, you get to the 1960s, movies and TV fall in love with Los Angeles Dodger players. Uh, Leo DeRocher, the Monsters. Leo never met a morning he liked, except 
when he had the day game. Uh, he was a night owl. But uh, for some reason, the Dodger third base coach, who has no authority to sign anybody, is walking through this neighborhood and steps between the bushes and he hears this baseball bat and Herman Munster is hitting these long, long fungos to his son, Edward Wolfgang Munster, and Leo comes in and offers him a contract immediately. Well, Herman does try out for the Dodgers. Notice he doesn't have the logo. They couldn't, they didn't, they decided not to pay for the rights for the logo for the hat and the, the uniform. Uh, anyway, he does try out, injures players, he's released. Uh, later on in the show, six months later, he's playing football with uh, Eddie Munster and he's punting. And the punts are going 100 yards or so. And Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch, the general manager of the Los Angeles Rams, comes out of the bushes, as does Leo. Don't, don't do it, Elroy, don't do it, you'll be sorry. So the whole show was about baseball. Jim Lefevre, Al Ferrara. Al Ferrara, there's a baseball card. Al Ferrara knew that he became a major league baseball player when he had his picture on the card. On the card. Uh, they're headhunters. Uh, and they're going to shrink Gilligan's head, of course. Years later, I saw a Frenchie, Jim Lefevre. He was the manager of the Seattle Mariners. I said, uh, how come you guys never told anybody that you were on this island? <laughs> he said, why, ruin it? He said, you never know when you get another guest spot on it. But there is Gilligan and two members of the Dodgers, Ferrara, Al Ferrara from Brooklyn, and Jim Lefebvre. Just the facts, man, just the facts. Does that look so dragnet? Does that really look dragnet? Like, yeah, just the facts. Uh, Johnny Roseboro was on dragnet. Uh, the Dodger owner, Walter O'Malley, any old Brooklyn Dodger fans in here? You are? Can I say O'Malley? Doesn't, doesn't matter, I say O'Malley, does it? I could say Robert Moses, too, because he's more of the problem with the Dodgers leaving. Anyway, O'Malley appeared with the Rifleman Star and the Brooklyn Dodger first baseman of the 50s, Chuck Connors in Brandon in 1965. The uh, Dodgers outfielder, Willie Davis, acted in The Love Machine, Jerry Lewis's movie, Which Way to the Front, and The Flying Nun, which came after ABC decided to uh, turn Sally Field from Gidget, who was too smart, to The Flying Nun. That's why they ended Gidget, because she was, the Gidget was too smart and the audience couldn't deal with it, according to ABC. Oh, Roseburg, Dragnet, 1968, Burke's Law. It kind of stereotyped him into these uh, police shows. Crash suspense theater, Mr. Ed. That's when Mr. Ed tried out for the Dodgers and experiment in terror. That's Phil Silvers, and that's Steve Bilko. Anybody in here remember Steve Bilko? Yeah. Steve Bilko was a great minor league player who was a tweener. He was a great minor league player who couldn't play, he was good enough to be in Major League Baseball, but would never, never be a star. Uh, he was called, Triple A, he was called a 4 a -er. Anyway, Steve Bilko and uh, Phil Silvers. What was Phil Silvers' name in the Phil Silvers show? Ernie Bilko, right? Nan Heike, the creator of the Phil Silvers show, supposedly took the name of the character, Sergeant Bilko, from a ball player whose long ball heroics for one of Los Angeles' two minor league teams of the mid-1950s made him a local celebrity. The other team was the Hollywood Stars. Um, anyway, uh, so Matt Hyken likes this guy, Bilko, which brings me up to a Yogi Berra story, my first Yogi Berra story. You might or might not recall that Yogi Berra was once on the Bilko show, along with about four or five other Yankees. So I'm sitting in that back room you know, where we started from, I said, hey, Yogi, what were the New York Yankees players doing in Kansas at Fort Baxter on the Phil Silver Show? We did it in the Bronx. Yeah, I know that where you shot the, the show at the Biograph Studios in the Bronx. I know that, but what was, yeah, what was the whole purpose of you being in Kansas? We shot it in the Bronx. I left my house. I went on the turnpike, got to the George Washington Bridge, and drove over to Southern Boulevard. At that point, he was right. It was, there was no use, no use in continuing that. None whatsoever. Uh, oh, Moose Stubing. 
manager Anaheim Angels back in the late 1980s. And this guy, Captain Stewart. Captain Stewart, any love boat people here? Anybody watch the love boat? Where do you think Captain Stewie got his name? Got from Moose Stewie. The producer, Aaron Spelling, the king of schlock. Everything he did was schlock, but was real successful. Fantasy Island, Charlie's Angels, and a whole bunch of others. He used the baseball encyclopedia to name some of his TV characters and named Captain Stube of the Love Boat after Moose Stube. And Moose once told me, yeah, that's me. I said, you gain royalties? He said, of course not. Oh, let's go full circle here. John Forsythe. John Forsythe was one of Aaron Spelling's stars in Dynasty, and uh, he's playing in the Dodgers Hollywood Stars you know, fundraiser. Next to him is Jack Lemon. Jack Lemon was in The Odd Couple in 1968 with Matthew. He played Felix, of course, and uh, Matthew played Oscar. And there's a scene at Shea Stadium where uh, Felix calls Oscar because he wants to know what he wanted for dinner. And Bill Mazeroski is up, it was originally supposed to be Roberto Clemente. Bill Mazeroski is up and he hits into a triple play. Clemente said, I'm not going to do it if I have to hit into a triple play. And Oscar, Oscar is on the phone. Now the old press box at Chase Stadium know it quite well. You have a pay phone like this, and the cord was really small, so this is the best you could do to see the field. They nailed it right in the movie. He couldn't see the field, and he would hail Brock. Uh, a sports writer who wore wild jackets said, uh, Oscar says, what happened? He said, you missed the best player of the year for the Mets, a triple play. And Oscar starts screaming at Felix, of course, because Felix wanted to know what his dinner was. Uh, Forsythe, his first paying job after college, the ballpark announcer at Evans Field for the Dodgers in the 1950s. And 30 years later, he's part of uh, Spelling's hit show, The Dynasty, in the 1980s. Uh, Bob Euchre, Mr. Baseball. Bob's a nice guy, really nice guy. We've spent, I've spent time with him just sitting here and talking about stories. Anyway, I'm going to make this, this brief with Bob Euchre. Bob Euchre, Sandy Koufax could not get Bob Euchre out. Go figure that one out. I mean, this guy couldn't hit, except Euchre hit him better than any other pitcher in the National League during his time as a backup catcher with Milwaukee, Philadelphia, St. Louis, and Atlanta. So he's out of baseball. And he's working in community relations for the Atlanta Braves. But he also has a comedy act that's going on. 1969, the trumpet player, Al Hurt, saw Euchre doing a stand-up, calls Johnny Carson immediately, and he says, you've got to have this guy on the show. He's just so funny, you have to have the guy on the show. And Johnny Carson takes Al Hurt's word for it, he's on the show, makes appearances about 100 times. Johnny had no idea he was a baseball player. They said, they tell me you were a baseball player. And Yuka goes into his pocket, takes out one of these. He said, yeah, I'm on one of these, so I must have been a baseball player during a break. Uh, Broadway, whatever Lola wants, Lola gets, right? How many of you saw uh, the play Damn Yankees? Mm -hmm. Damn Yankees. Damn Yankees are still winning. Washington's still losing, except they won the World Series in 2019. Uh, anyway, uh, one group. Joe Boyd sells his soul to the devil, Mr. Applegate. Jerry Lewis once played Mr. Applegate, which kind of fit his, his, life, his life's character, I suppose. He's looking for one good long ball hitter for his team, the Washington Senators. Mr. Applegate grants his wish, turning him into a 22-year-old sports superstar who must go back to his wife before 9 p.m. on the final game day if he doesn't want Mr. Applegate to get his soul. Oh, what was the other hit so song from uh, uh, Dan Yankees besides uh, whatever Lola wants, Lola, Lola gets? You gotta have heart. The 1969 Mets. All right, Ed Sullivan. There he is with the 1969 Mets. And of course, what song are they singing? You gotta have heart. Now my cousin Jerry Stiller, 
Stillmore Merrill, who was on that show about 36 times, so we got to talk about, oh, this meant that he wanted to make sure the acts got on a, got off on time because he had commercials to sell. He was a ring announcer uh, back in the Golden Gloves days in this corner and that corner, so, yeah, anyway. But that's a good segment to uh, my cousin Jerry with my kids a number of years ago. Uh, my cousin Jerry, hmm, what's he got to do with this? Well, he was Frank Costanza on Seinfeld. He was Frank Costanza. Uh, and there's George, George Steinbrother, and Seinfeld. Uh, the Stein floor, Steinbrother influence on Seinfeld. Uh, you know, George had influence on Seinfeld, direct influence on Seinfeld, in that he would send in story ideas to Larry David, who turned them into at least three shows. Missing George Costanza, board meeting move, different uniforms. Missing George is my favorite one of all, because uh, the story goes that George Steinbrenner had one of these employees at American Ship in Tampa, who uh, he thought was hanging out with kind of shady characters, right? And he's kind of worried about it, because he thought he'd bet on games and all that. And uh, so it's Friday. Uh, George leaves the office and uh, says goodbye to everybody. And uh, this guy is, is there, but he leaves. And uh, he leaves his car there. And George gets there about 4.30 in the morning on Monday morning, because he got there early. And he sees the guy's car is there. Uh-oh, something happened to him. What happened to him? George calls the Tampa police. All points bulletin, because he's convinced this guy is in trouble, uh, and he may be dead. He may be dead for all that we're uh, concerned. They turned that into a show. And you might remember the show when George Steinbrenner and the Yankees traveling secretary visit uh, Jerry Stewart, Frank Costanza's apartment, knock on the door, and uh, and uh, they, they say, Mr. Costanza, we think we have bad news for you. We think George is dead. And uh, Frank is looking. He says, you, you traded, you traded Jay Buhner for Ken Phelps? <laughs> if you're a baseball fan, you catch that immediately. Uh, oh, the guy, he showed up Monday afternoon. He went away with friends, and George was relieved. Uh, board meeting move, that was pretty simple. If you knew George, your food was his food. He went to... Uh, I just stick his hand in there and, oh, I want to taste it. Uh, and this really happened, according to uh, one of the Yankee PR guys. I think it was Dave Zen. Uh, somebody brought in something at Yankee Stadium, and George said, I smell something. And uh, he moves the whole, the whole board meeting to a restaurant by Yankee Stadium. Different uniforms were tried with the Tampa Yankees, a polyester type uniform, see if it was cooler. Uh, so all three of those shows came from George Steinberg. Uh, George actually didn't pass the audition. He failed the audition. They decided to have him on. You go up to YouTube and you can watch this and you can see immediately why he failed. He must have thought he was Olivia. Uh, Seinfeld. He actually did a scene in the show. It was terrible. We couldn't use him. We cut it out. Uh, he wasn't funny. I don't remember exactly what went wrong with it, but it was quite an awkward situation. Keith Hernandez ended up on the show. He ended up becoming very friendly with Jerry Seinfeld, and this is when George Costanza is jealous because Jerry has a new best friend, uh, Keith Hernandez. Keith Hernandez said when his agent, Scott Boris, asked him if he wanted to be on uh, Seinfeld, he said, what's that? <laughs> Boris said, well, they're going to fly you out first class. They're going to put you up in a nice hotel and give you 15 grand for the wages. Oh, I know who Seinfeld is. Let's go. <laughs> and he was there. George hosted Saturday Night Live. George did host Saturday Night Live. I'm going to give you a quick story about George's talent. Uh, Eddie Layton was a friend of mine. He was the Yankee Stadium organist. And uh, during the summer, he would live on his boat off of the Tappan Sea Bridge on the Westchester side. That's where he'd live. And uh, he gets to the stadium early. And uh, he would test out the organ. And George walks in. And, uh, he, uh, George says, uh, George tried to play a little bit of piano and organ. said, uh, Eddie, can I try that out? And he said, well, you're the boss. You own everything. So sure. He says, uh, well, I want to try it. He said, tell me what you think. And then he said, well, I can't do it here. I've got to walk out to, to hear it in the stadium. So he goes out, hears it in the stadium, and he walks back in. And George says, what do you think? And then he said, you're fired. <laughs> 
Eddie and Bob Shepard would never have been fired by church. Never. I mean, those, they, they were, Bob, the voice of God, and Eddie, uh, George loved them, and uh, that's why Eddie could say you're fired. Oh, Saturday Night Live, in a dream, he manages the Yankees, he plays every position on the field. I don't know if that was a dream or not. I think that's what he wanted to do. When George ran the Yankees, he was the owner, he was the PR guy, he was the TV director, he was the manager, and he would have been a player if he could have been a player. He was a piece of work. Uh, oh, remember this guy, Chico Escuela, baseball been very, very good to me, the actor Garrett Morris. Uh, if you want this to run a little late, I have a story about this. If you don't mind sitting for an extra four or five minutes. Okay, you want to hear the story? Okay. Uh, baseball been very, very good to me. A retired Hispanic player with limited command of the English language, he wrote a tell-all book, Bad Stuff About the Mets. Sample, Tom Seaver. He once borrowed Chico soap, no give it back. In spring training of 1979, Chico's unsuccessful comeback attempt was documented on several update segments. Okay, here's the story. Okay, if you don't mind staying for an extra five minutes, here's the story. Okay. Both Channel 9 and Channel 11 are doing the Mets Yankees game when this is taking place, that it's Chico Escuela night. And uh, Phil Rizzuto walks in, and uh, Ralph Kiner is there, and he's there with Ralph Robbins and somebody else sitting at the table, the Mets people. And uh, Phil says hello to Ralph, and he says, hey, wait, who's this Chico Escuela guy? Ralph's next door neighbor in Palm Springs was Phil Harris. You know who Phil Harris was? Phil Harris was on the Jack Benny show. He also did the song Smoke That Cigarette, among other things. He had a radio show. It's a comedy performer. And a lot of what Ralph learned in comedy came from Phil Harris. Because Ralph was an actor while he was doing the Channel 9 games. A nice guy, too. Really nice guy. In fact, he is part of the basis of my 1946 talk about labor in America. But that's another story. Anyway, so Rizzuto sits down with him. He says, who's this Chico Escuela guy? He said, Casey thought he was going to turn this franchise around. Really? He said, oh yeah, until he had that terrible accident. What accident? Oh, it was just so bad nobody wants to talk about it. But Casey was, he was so high on this guy. He was going to be the Mets' first superstar. He could run, he could feel, he could do all this other stuff. But he had that unfortunate accident. What accident? We can't talk about. So there's the sipping coffee and all that. Bill White walks in and Scooter says, time to go, we gotta do our opening. <laughs> they do the opening, fortunately it's out of tape. And, he said, and uh, they said, I'm Bill White, I'm Phil Rizzuto, welcome to the Yankee game. And uh, here it is, the Mets and the Yankees. And Phil says, it's Chico Escuela night. <laughs> Bill's like, what? It's Chico Escuela night. He said, who? He said, oh. Casey, Casey thought he was going to be a great player for the Mets. White says to him, I told you that story. It's a rough kind. Cut. Phil runs back into the room. They're finishing the coffee. You fooled me. You fooled me. You fooled me. And Kiner's just laughing because he's making it up as he goes. And Phil was so gullible, he believed the story. She goes away. Wally Pitt. Now, I was going to take this out because I figured nobody remembers Wally Pitt. Except I was watching Jeopardy on September 14, 2020. Wally's the answer to a Jeopardy question. Season 37, show one. Who is Lou Gehrig? Because they said uh, he, he replaced Wally Pitt as the uh, Yankee first baseman. The myth, Pitt lost his job to Lou Gehrig on June 2, 1925 because he had a headache. Simple, Gerard was bad. Um, he was hit, he was beamed and had a headache and all that from that. But the lesson learned when someone in a role temporarily leaves their position and is replaced by a much better unknown person who takes the position, then that person was Wally Pitt. I didn't think anybody would know, except I watched Jeopardy. Cigarettes, you know, Babe Ruth died of throat cancer. Uh, if you could see this picture, it looks like he's on old Sparky and Sing Sing. Uh, but you really can't see that picture. Uh, old gold, uh, not a, right off the bat, the best, not a cough, not a cough in the car load. Cigarettes was a big deal. Bull Durham, uh, 
cigarettes, well, uh, cigarettes, these are people who always buy Chesterfield, uh, Bucky Harris, the Yankee manager with a suit and tie, uh, Bob Elliott, who was with the Boston Braves, uh, won the uh, National League MVP, uh, Teddy Ballgame, Ted Williams, Stan Mutual, looks like somebody knocked out a tooth, just stuck a cigarette. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, guaranteed Joe DiMaggio did not pay for that. He did not pay for his cigarettes. He had short arms and long pockets. Yo Blackwell. Uh, okay, Yogi, World Series in TV. Well, Yogi was in the World Series every October except 54 and 59. And Yogi was always on. And he never looked like a baseball player. Never, ever looked like a baseball player. He's a squat guy, and he would drive the sabermatics people today crazy. Because his, his buddy, Joe Gargiola, who knew him from his time used to, once told me, if Yogi saw a pitch he liked, if it was up here, he'd swing at it. If it was down there, he'd swing at it. He would drive hitting coaches absolutely crazy today. But he said, Yogi could hit. And Yogi could hit. Anyway, Gargiola also told me one other thing. He says, when Yogi steps in it, he steps in it. Meaning that he can find the gusher anywhere. Like this, Yuhu, Yogi Berra, Mickey Mantle. Guarantee he didn't drink Yuhu. They had to be Cuddy Sark in there. Uh, so Moose Goward, who is one of the nicest people I ever met. Moose Goward met his wife because he went dancing at Arthur Murray's. Why did he go dancing at Arthur Murray's? Because Casey thought he could hit, but he couldn't play shortstop. He had no foot movement. So Casey sent him to Arthur Murray's. He said, it may be a major leaguer, and take a look. They call me Moose, look at my face, and I got this wife. Uh, Elston Howard. Uh, Yogi meets the Alvary family at the New Jersey Country Club in 1955 when the Alvary's beverage was having trouble getting distributed. Yogi tastes the drink, and the Alvary say, what's your opinion? Yogi's on board. Yogi's on board, and all of a sudden this thing is selling. Uh, Yogiism. One time I was in, this is told to me by Dave Cap. One time I was in the office and the phone rang when no one else was around. I always answered a ringing phone, so I did. The woman who was calling me asked if you who was hyphenated. I said, no ma'am, it isn't even carbonated. <laughs> oh, crafts Italian dressing. For me, it's got everything. Sure makes salad, salad swell. Oh, remember when you had to put water in the battery? Yeah. I'm old enough to remember putting water in the battery by 1966. Chevrolet Capri station wagon. I had to put water in the back. Okay? Uh, Yogi says, I have water only three times a year. Presto Light, high level battery. Oh, beer? He sold beer. Yeah, Miller, uh, Miller Light. Uh, oh, bicycles. Hey, kids, tell your parents what you want for Christmas. You want a bicycle. His teammate was Joe DiMaggio. And Yogi and I were in the back room one day. And I said, did you ever go out with Joe D in Maryland? Ever meet Maryland? He said, yeah, we went out one night. I said, what did you talk about? He said, I don't remember. Nobody talked. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true in Joe's case. Probably very true in Joe's case. Anyway, uh, so I, I've gotten a lot of hearsay stories over the years from people like Johnny Blanchard, and, uh, who seemed to be some sort of Yankee historian while he played there. He must have been. He was a third string catcher. And uh, there is a hearsay story about Joe. I'm not going to go into the whole hearsay story. By the way, I guarantee he's at the Star Club. He didn't pay for anything. He didn't pay for anything. Anyway, January 14, 1954, Joe DiMaggio, Marilyn Monroe, eloped in San Francisco. October 1954, Monroe filed for divorce, citing only mental cruelty. Had something to do with that. At Stanford, Connecticut, 2017. Oh, by the way, this is a church. So when you walk out of the church, <laughs> guess what you saw? The uh, derriere of uh, 26 uh, foot Maryland. And uh, by the way, there's a church over here. So the first thing you saw was the altar top uh, as you walked out. And these church, these these people went to church, complained and complained in Stanford to get the statue out of there, but they gave them a permit. And it travels from city to city every year. Uh, DiMaggio walked onto the set of Seven Year Itch. He was dismayed by the uh, sight of uh, his wife on exhibit for more than 2,000 strangers. What the hell is going on here? See, uh, Joe, uh, this is what Joe wanted in the wife. He wanted a stay at home wife who made dinner for him every night, 
who made less money than him and was less famous than him. Uh, she didn't check any of those boxes. Now, what happened that night? Yankee players have told me they have a pretty good idea of what happened that night. Um, and so do a lot of other people. Because shortly after uh, the publicized uh, event, uh, Joe and Marilyn filed for divorce. Uh, she said extreme cruelty, uh, mental cruelty was the problem. Baseball and song, Mrs. Robinson, which started out as Mrs. Roosevelt. Uh, we didn't start the fire. Joe and Joe, did you see Jackie hit that ball? Duke Ellington. Maybe it was Billy who wrote it. It was Draymond. Uh, and Mickey by Teresa Brewer. Uh, well, you've probably heard this song about 25,000 times over the years. Probably. Mrs. Robinson, Simon and Garfield. Uh, uh, Mrs., or rather, uh, the graduate was being shot. Mike Nichols was looking for some music, and there was you know, a little music, uh, that, 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 just some incidental music uh, that Paul Simon wrote. People said, why don't you turn that into a two? You can turn it into a two. And uh, he does, obviously. But he's looking for a hero. He's looking for a genuine American hero. And he first thinks of Eleanor Roosevelt. Then he thinks of Ted Williams, who was a genuine hero as a former Yankee in infielder and Yankee announcer and Padres announcer. Jerry Coleman said, John, um, Ted Williams was everything in life that John Wayne wanted to be. And so he's writing this song, and he brings the song to uh, Mike Nichols. He says, hey, you know, it's Mrs. Robinson now, isn't it? Because he had the chance in the movie, so it becomes Mrs. Robinson. So Paul Simon and Joe D. meet for dinner. Again, Johnny Blanchard, maybe it was Tommy Tresh, tell me the story. Uh, oh, Paul Simon paid for dinner, not Joe. Anyway. They say that Joe walks in and he looks at Paul Simon, he's met, and he says, what do you mean where have I gone? I just did a Mr. Coffee commercial. I did a Bowery commercial. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm here. I'm here. And Paul Simon tries to explain to him, he says, well, I was 10 years old when he last played baseball. I never saw you after I was 10 years old. And Joe's like, but I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. So eventually, Paul uses intellect to try to explain to Maggio, who doesn't understand it to like, well, I meant this and I wanted to do this, and then, then, and then finally Paul Simon gives up. They eat, and that's the end of that. Paul Simon is on the Dick Cabot show, and he says, uh, I said that I didn't mean the lines literally, that I thought of him as a genuine, uh, him as an American hero, and that genuine heroes were in short supply. He accepted the explanation, thanked me, we shook hands, said good night, and Paul paid the bill for it. Uh, and here is Cabot on the, uh, or rather uh, Simon on the Dick Cabot show. And Dick Cabot knew another story. Mantle and DiMaggio hated one another. Absolutely despised one another. Joe was jealous. He's playing center field for the Yankees in 1951. He looks to his uh, left and there's this blonde god. His name, Mantle, comes from the earth. And he's chiseled. Looks good. Joe's got a bad leg and he's done, right? He's done. Jealousy. Meanwhile, Mickey's playing right field. There's a fly ball into right center field, and Mickey trips over a drain or a springboard and tears up his name. Mickey said he never forgave Joe because Joe loafed on the ball. So they hated each other. They absolutely hated each other, although they would pose and be good sports. And if you had another five hours, they'd give you about five hours stories about the two of them. Anyway, Kevin asked, uh, why was Mantle's name used? And Simon responded, it's about syllables, Dick. It's about how many beats there are. Terry Cashman, we share the same period Dantes in Riverdale. Uh, Terry was the baseball balladeer in the early 1980s. And oh, speaking of missing teeth, somebody's missing here. There's Duke, there's Willie, there's Mickey. Who's missing? Joe D. Um, talking Baseball, Willie, Mickey, and the Duke, 1981 song written and performed by Terry Cashman, um, who I've known for a long time. Uh, DiMaggio was also in the photo when he's airbrushed out.
DiMaggio once asked Terry, where was I? He said, it's a fat guy from the 50s. He said, my teammate showed him. And Joe said, well, yeah, you're right. I really didn't play in the 50s except for two years. Oh, here's the scooter. Uh, you Huckleberry, only guy with gold record in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Oh, and there's Mr. Loaf, Meatloaf, with my son, way back when. Remember when the New York Times called him Mr. Loaf? Anyway, I was talking to Meatloaf one day, and I said, uh, what's his, how'd you get Scooter? He said, we got him, and he was terrible. He wasn't being Phil Rizzuto. It took about 120 takes before we got the one we wanted. We said to him, just be Phil. Phil Rizzuto provides a play-by-play -play broadcast. The player's an aggressive base runner and nearly gets called out a few times. He eventually tries for a suicide squeeze on his way to home plate. Scooter never knew it was about sex until his college-age kids told him in 1978. And Huckleberry, that Huckleberry, he fooled me. He still got the record? Yeah. That was once the most expensive baseball card on the market, the hottest way of their card. Baseball cards were not mass produced until the mid-1980s when tobacco companies such as Old Judge, Gypsy Queen, inserted cards inside their products featuring illustrations of players mainly to keep the flimsy packaging intact. 1911, American tobacco company T206 Wagner sold for $6.6 .6 million, August of 2021. Legend had it that Wagner was a teetotaler who abhorred the use of his likeness to sell tobacco. The production of the card was limited. The Mick. This card is worth less than a buck. <coughs> the Mick. 1952 Mickey Mantle baseball card sold for $12.6 million <coughs> on August 28, 2022, according to Heritage Auctions. The card is the most valuable collectible in the world. Now, quick backstory to this. I knew Cy Berger, who invented the modern baseball card. He got stuck with the seven, his sixth and seventh series of cards, kept them in warehouses for a long time, decided there was no value in them. 1960, they loaded up onto a barge, sent it out to the Atlantic Ocean, dump it, and that's why this card is so valuable. Cy Berger's baseball cards. Cy Berger. Uh, they could do a number of things. Uh, if you really wanted to, in the back of the card, and you kept up to date daily, you could learn how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Gambling. Let me show you how. Gambling. Yeah. I won. <laughs> they both came up back. Uh, or you could do uh, one of these things. I won again. Wow. If I was eight years old again, I'd be happy. Gambling. How many of you? Never thought of doing that as gambling. It's your introduction to gambling. What are you doing? You're gambling your cards away, right? And maybe you'll get a Sandy Koufax in return, although it didn't seem like anybody ever put Sandy Koufax up for off, up in those games. Geography, uh, you know, you, you can see this guy, this is Minnesota. So if you're so inclined, you can look at the map and find where Minnesota was. And how many of you use these as bicycle flaps? Bicycle flaps. The baseball card was sort of an early day computer for all of us. Oh yeah, honored by the Baseball Hall of Fame. Homer Simpson is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. As is Casey at the bat, John Fogarty's center field from 1985. League of Their Own, the movie, and who's on first? Uh, football's number one by 1965, Joe Namath, who had the tryout with the Chicago Cubs. Uh, I'm to the right when I had here, and that's Bruce Morton, my friend, uh, who's now in Denver to uh, my left. This is 1988, Joe reminiscing about the Super Bowl, which cemented the NFL as number one in the nation with the Jets upset. Uh, this guy couldn't say boxing, Muhammad Ali. Uh, sad part about this picture was that by this point, he could barely speak above the whisper in 1985. Horse racing. Well, horse racing is being saved by gambling uh, in a lot of uh, horse tracks. 1950 is uh, Frank DeFord said on the show I did with him back in 1999. <coughs> Baseball, horse racing, boxing dominated American sports. Television changed that dynamic. By 1965, football surpassed baseball in popularity. There aren't any new songs. 
not much in the way of new literature, which reminds me of the old one day in the 1950s, Ernest Hemingway came to a Yankees game. And uh, he's brought to the clubhouse after the game, and he's introduced to all the players. Ernest Hemingway, Wendy Ford. Wendy Ford, Ernest Hemingway. Or Hemingway, Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle, Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway, Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra, Ernest Hemingway. What paper do you work for, Ernie? <laughs> Kansas City Star, that's what he should have said. Old Man in the Sea, which you probably have here, Old Man in the Sea. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, Yankee Clippers in there. No real new movies. I mean, there are movies here, but other than Moneyball, what's lasting? Uh, it's just another sport. Uh, Jim Bat, you must have the book Ball Four there. Jim and I were on the circuit, but we only were on the same platform once uh, at Yogi Berra's museum. Uh, I was in Ithaca one week, he was there the next week, etc., etc. He, read, uh, he wrote the quintessential baseball book, Ball Four. Humanized Players, one of the 20 most influential books of the 20th century, according to the New York Public Library, used this. I'm almost done. I got two more minutes if you want to stick, stick around. Uh, used as part of the arbitration when Peter Seitz ended the reserve clause. I'm in a soccer documentary from 2015 called The Sons of Ben. I'm in no baseball documentaries about how soccer is now taking over with kids. Uh, Barzan in 2007, the commercialization is beyond anything that was ever thought of, the overvaluing, really, of the game itself. It's out of proportion to the place an entertainment ought to be. Other things are similarly commercialized and out of proportion. But for baseball, which is so intimately connected with the nation's spirits and tradition, it's a disaster. Barzan gave up on baseball before his death. And it ain't over until it's over, right? It ain't over until it's over. And you're going to be expecting a huge story about this, right? You're going to be, you know, like if you see a fork in the road, take it. Or nobody goes to that restaurant anymore because it's too crowded. Uh, right? You expect this great story. Well, you're going to be disappointed. It's not a great story. 1973, Yogi's managing the Mets. And the Mets are treading water all season. They have a lot of injuries, Seavers out, other people are out early. But they all come back in September. And the team gets hot. Uh, and they're in the pennant race because nobody else is doing rather well in the National League East. But it's a razor thin chance that they have. Mike Dyer passed away two years ago. He's with the Long Island Press, a guy I know. And uh, games at Chase Stadium. Mets lose the game. And they really can't afford to lose too many games. They lose this game. And Mike Dyer says, uh, Yogi, is it over? They lost the game. Ain't over until it's over. That's it. It's over. Thank you very much. It's over. Any questions? Any Ain't over until it's over. Question, why do you think the Mickey because Mickey is contemporary still, even though he played his last game 54 years ago. Right. There are a lot of guys my age that you see on their back, they're wearing number seven. So uh, Mickey, Bob Costas carries a 1958 Mickey Mantle card in his wallet. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember when Alan Rosen owned that card. Mr. Mint. And uh, he had about a, a dozen Mantle. 52 tops at that time, and you were trying to sell them for $50,000 a piece yeah. when they were retailing at about 12 yeah. at that time. And the guy who bought the best one, that's the car that just sold. 9.5 grade. Yeah. I have one short story for you. Go ahead. Uh, in a league of, hey Bob, you know, a league of their own, uh, Peggy Marshall wanted uh, a jersey to say, some peaks go on it. Yeah. And so she had her friend, her guys look around and find the name of the team. And they came up with Peekskill Parks, and that's the jersey that the Donald wore. Yeah. And of course, there was no Peekskill Parks baseball team at that time. She probably should have had Kingston on it, not Peekskill. But um, I own that jersey. Oh, good. <laughs> I have that. It's worth one. 
And you'll, re you'll remember when I wrote to you about the big skill. He passed away in Great Barrington a couple years ago. I was going to go up to see him and uh, good buddies with John Thorne. Yeah, he, uh, he, he wasn't recognizing anybody by that point. Was it? Oh, okay. something else though.